today is an important day for NAUS. Maybe not so many of you in the room know our company well. It's true, we have been rather discreet until now, but it's about to change. Today, we are opening a new chapter. We'll begin by shining a spotlight on a very discussed, a very important topic for our society, aging. Now, we'd like this event to be interactive. We would like you to take part in the debate. So you can see behind me a number. You just can use WhatsApp. And you will have the opportunity to ask your question. And we will have 10 minutes, 15 minutes at the end of the conference to answer as many questions as we can, time permitting. So speaking of questions. Let's start with a quick question for all of you. How many in the room would like to live to be 120? <laughs> Please, raise your hand. How many? No, but when I mean one, 120, I mean in good health huh? and good health. <laughs> OK, so to help you make up your mind, to convince you, I am really delighted to welcome the person behind this breakthrough discovery, along with a reporter for CNN, our media partner. So let's give a warm welcome to Professor Miroslav Wanman and Claire Sebastian. Mm -hmm. Hello, Claire. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I would like to welcome again Professor Radman, who, as many of you may know, is a leading molecular geneticist who has a career spanning more than five decades, I think, many continents from his native Croatia to Brussels to Harvard and in a sort of symmetry reminiscent of DNA back again to Croatia and who has spent the best part of 50 years, I think, working specifically on DNA, a DNA-centric focus. And his latest discovery really turns that on his head. You see the words, a new paradigm. So we're going to talk about that today. I want to ask you first, Professor Radman, tell us about this new discovery. How did you arrive at that point? Mm. Well, it's true. Over 40 years, I've been uh, working in the area of molecular repair, which is some kind of molecular microsurgery uh, of DNA that gets damaged from sunlight, from chemicals, and from metabolism, from free radicals. And, uh, and then after, after that many years, I thought, well, let me try something where people would be more interested, and I'm becoming more interested because I was I was, in the meantime, I was aging. And um, to see the limits of life, to see uh, how robust can a life based, carbon-based life based on DNA, RNA proteins, uh, how robust can it be? And there was a champion of it known since end of Second World War uh, when uh, the... Uh, <clears throat> when the canned meat for soldiers was sterilized by gamma rays. Canned meat. Uh, it was after closing the meat, uh, they were exposed to huge dose of a gamma rays uh, to kill all the bacteria or yeast, whatever. And yet there was a contaminant in, of colonies, or orange, orange uh, uh, color co colonies, of bacteria that then, you know, taken and irradiated directly, not in the can, survived uh, doses of radiation thousand, two thousand times higher than other bacteria and then our own cells. Right. So the question was, is this, is this normal life? Yeah, it is. It has DNA just as others. It has proteins and so on. And this was the beginning of uh, uh, exploring uh, why and how? How is it possible? Why others die and how these don't die? It's this huge doses. And what was seen that DNA is pulverized in hundreds of little pieces, cut 
And then uh, after two, three hours, the bacterium managed to take this DNA text all in little pieces and put it in the right order without any further mutation, without, any muta without mistake. How can a bacterium be so intelligent? How can it, who can read these sequences and say, aha, I know how it was before cutting, now I, I see the fragments, but I remember, I will put them all in the order. It was an intellectual challenge. And it was exciting, and we published a nice paper in Nature. There was a lot of comments all over, all over the world. But this was not most important. Most important was the simplicity of the solution of this enigma. The solution of the enigma was that we shouldn't have concentrated on DNA. It's spectacular that something out of ashes resurrects DNA. You know, I, I was joking at the time that we should apply for grant to Vatican, you know, the molecular basis of resurrection. Uh, but uh, what at the end of the day, as the, in England say, at the end of the day, it turned out that the solution is almost banal, so simple. And that, is, that made me believe that we are on the good way. The simplicity was that DNA clearly is not protected, it's massacred, and then proteins which do everything in life, including repairing genes and copying genes and reading genes into functions and so on, that the proteins were uh, protected. Unlike in other species where the proteins with, with radiation were oxidized quickly, here, 1,000, 5,000, 10,000 grays, which are monstrous doses, on the level of protein, nothing was happening. You wouldn't say that it was irradiated. And that was the secret. The secret was that if you protect function of life, which is proteins, you know, DNA is information, is the instruction to make function, to make proteins, but Life is proteins, and I'll give you just quickly an example. Globule rouge, erythrocytes, have no DNA, yeah. and they function two to four months. Mm -hmm. uh, very hard work, by the way, you know, uh, uh, playing with, 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 with oxygen and with free radicals and so on. So a cell can be live, living, functioning without genes, as long as the proteins would last. Where we need genes is when the proteins burn out, they are sensitive, get oxidized, rusted, corroded, and they go into the garbage. Uh, we need to make fresh proteins. And there, the d genes are necessary to make new proteins. So, okay, so that was it, that it is banal. There was nothing new. It was simple, and I'm proud that we can today, in a few minutes, explain the simplicity, unlike anybody in the world now about aging and diseases, that I can uh, shock you mildly by saying aging is simple, diseases is simple. What is complicated are the consequences of diseases and consequences of, of, of aging. But the cause is simple and we can act on that cause in order to mitigate to, to prevent all of the diseases and to slow down the, the, the aging. What is done now is looking for the consequences of the consequences of the consequences, and they are called biomarker. Something goes up, something goes down in, in aging and disease, and then you target the molecules of pharmaceutical companies, and there's no result there. So zero, zero success. Away. So I'll, I'll Play, I'll play the bad boy so uh, we later have and, decades and, and say of, it, yeah, yeah, in We have decades way. of what you would call a DNA-centric approach now turned upside down, and you're looking more mm -hmm. at the role of the proteins in replicating, repairing, reading yes. DNA. I want to home in on one uh, type of cell. You correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not a scientist. Uh, called Deinococcus radiodurans. Is that yes. correct? I've been practicing. Um, <laughs> which has become instrumental, I believe, in yes. your research as one of the more robust organisms that can provide the inspiration for further sort of slowing down, yes. essentially, of the aging process. Tell me more about that. 
It's in the Guinness Book of Records as the most robust uh, uh, living organism uh, uh, bacterium. And um, who wants to catch it can, can catch it uh, while snow or rain is falling. Mm -hmm. uh, because with balloons, it was found in a totally in vacuum, in stratosphere, totally dehydrated, desiccated, irradiated with UVC light a thousand times uh, more intense than at, at Earth for who knows, months, years, and then eventually it falls down with, with, with snow or rain. And what happens is that this totally dehydrated organism irradiated to a thousand times over, over deadly dose, doses, rehydrates and finds sufficient amount of still active proteins which start recovery, rebuilding, uh, you know, like after the war, like Dresden, you know, that it, you need the somebody surviving to start now cleaning the, the houses and building. And this is what happens with this Dinococcus radioduron. And this is a, a single so, cell organism, Yeah, right? it is yeah. so massacred, but it has still enough of proteins for, for the cell. Uh, 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 proteins are like uh, people for a city. All right, uh, and and for the cell, the membrane is the skin, all right? And this is key things that we are eventually going going to to discuss. And so, what saved life? What what saved life in the in the sense that this clinically dead bacterium will resurrect after rehydration and so on? Is that that not all proteins are dead? Right. If it were my cells or Escherichia coli all proteins would be dead and there would be no, 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 rec no back to life. Yeah. Here it is possible because the Dinococcus radiodurans invested into synthesis of something uh, that other organisms didn't invest as much. And this is the small molecular complexes which bind to lie down, bind physically, not chemically, bind to proteins, and therefore they are called chaperons, comme le chaperon, you know, in, 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 in all, all times, the, the ladies protecting the, the young um, girls from bad, bad guys. And uh, these chaperons, uh, these chaperons then lie around, stick around the protein, and they are also antioxidant. Mm -hmm. So they don't float around and to neutralize free radicals. It's there like the protection of the president mm -hmm. by the, uh, by the body, bodyguards, you know, kill me instead of, uh, <laughs> instead of president. So these molecules are sacrificial molecules. Right. They are killed by oxidation and, and they, in a way, you know, quote unquote, sacrifice themselves to protect important molecules such as proteins or, 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 or DNA. So Dinococcus told us this story. Right. Now we could turn to more normal uh, 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 organisms and creature, and finally to people, and see, can we, uh, what are these molecules? What are these chaperone, antioxidant chaperones? Can we, can we try them? Would it protect our proteins? The answer is yes. There's no right. private property of Dinococcus that these chaperones would protect only Dinococcus' own proteins. It would protect equally well, we tested that, Anita is not here, unfortunately, <laughs> she did that, uh, that it will protect our proteins and uh, Escherichia coli proteins equally well. Okay? So how but, do we take what we've learned from Dinococcus and how do we get those chaperones? How do we become more like this extremely we do robust have, organism? We do, have, we do have chaperones. We have uh, plenty of different families of chaperones without which we couldn't live. Yeah. Without this, but these are protein. These are protein doctors of sick proteins. Be like our doctors are people like yeah. us, and they, they heal. They try to heal uh, other people. So these proteins are the protein doctors for misfolded, mis. Uh, the term in English is misfolded, but for for. Uh, in a vulgar way, for screwed up proteins, right. would say, okay, vulgar, I would say, screwed up proteins. It's not like this, which is perfect, and then this protein is 
resistant to oxidation because evolution uh, 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 did over two and a half billion years since the oxygen went up due to f photosynthesis and then oxygen free radicals evolved and the, and the efficient metabolism which makes a lot of energy but makes a lot of free radicals so so, rusting okay so uh, there, there are uh, uh, we couldn't live and even even the bacterium cannot live without these uh, protein uh, chaperons. But there's a help, there's a backup system of more primitive chemical chaperons, which look a little bit like vitamin A, you know, beta carotene, uh, the, the double bond, single bond, uh, like this. And then at the end, they have some, some other groups. And so th there's this primitive system that is backup system. And Dinococcus uses this primitive system to, in an exaggerated way in a con high concentration yeah. and it allows Dinococcus to be the Guinness Book of <laughs> Record most robust cell that we know. So I think the question is what are the implications of this discovery that essentially proteins can rebuild in certain cases damaged, broken, mm -hmm. shattered DNA? Yes. What are the implications for health? Your book talks about the key to immortality. Is that what we're looking at here? Yeah, yes, let's, let, let's, let's now jump to the people. From, yeah. uh, do you agree? Yes. Okay. Uh, the, the, um, <clears throat> what, what we have learned by analyzing particular human proteins, those that are linked with predisposition to early onset of, of, of heavy diseases like Parkinson's disease yeah. and, and Charcot disease, uh, amyloid, uh, uh, amylotropic uh, lateral sclerosis and so on. Uh, what we learned 15 years, I'm, I may be telling things very simply and, and joking a little bit, but 15 years of life, uh, not only mine, but of, of, of about a, a, a dozen of young people, that's, that's not a joke. And so what we learned is that uh, the chemistry of aging. We want, wanted to know, well, if the chemistry of protection against radiation, which is protection against free radicals, uh, against the rusting, uh, is there an overlap? And the answer was yes. There is a large overlap over radiation resistance and time resistance, chrono resistance. That means living long, right? right? Because, uh, again, nothing is more dangerous to life, to human life for sure, than living. Living is the most toxic activity uh, concerning the, uh, the reason that I'm saying, uh, maybe you saw me smoking, uh, have a cigarette there. If you smoke double of the number of cigarettes, uh, the risk of lung cancer so will double, okay? It's a linear. The more you damage the DNA, maybe whatever, the more you are exposed to something toxic, the, in, a, in a linear way, proportionally, there's a risk. With time, with time, the risk of dying, of getting all of these cardiovascular, the neurodegenerative uh, malignant diseases goes with fifth power of time. It's not like this, the curve is like this. But how if can you, the If you double the age from 30 yeah. to 60, the risk of dying and getting the disease goes 32 times. But if we irradiate the people or have them force them to smoke more, then doubling the dose will double the risk. So how do so these So most dangerous help? is to live. Uh, and we wanted to know the chemistry yes. of it. And the, and the chemistry is oxidation, oxidative damage to proteins. Right. It right. goes, the, a, a small worm which lives three weeks will, in the course of his life, will accumulate the same proportion, the same amount of oxidized proteins as we will, uh, as somebody in, who lives 100 years, it, it will. So it's, whether you live three weeks or 100 years, the amount of accumulation of damaged proteins is the same, all right?
So it's the damage to the proteins that causes the aging. This is your discovery, not damage to DNA or, or the cells. This is about cell death causing aging. Yes. And you're looking at protecting these proteins. This is how we take this forward. This is because the dependence, you know, pe people were obsessed, myself first, with elegance of, you know, DNA and this information is like poetry, is whatever you want uh, to amuse yourself. But uh, DNA, life of DNA depends on proteins. The life of proteins, once they are synthesized, does not depend on, on, on DNA anymore. Erythrocyte, right? Only pro proteins, no, no DNA, and it works well as long as the proteins are active. Yeah. Once they are burned out, new ones cannot be synthesized because there's no gene, no instruction to make. So the chemistry of aging is simple, is oxidation of proteins. What is complicated are the consequences of that damage. The, and and the, this, is, this is important. One, one thing I, I, I bet you to, to, to remember is that because it's a, it's a judgment of entire science in the last uh, half century. Uh, and that is that the, uh, what cancer research has done is to positively, is to provide a lot of knowledge about normal cells. By studying cancer, you compare with non-cancer and you start understanding the consequences of that disease. You learn nothing about the cause or the way to go back. You cannot. So the cancer research and biomedical research is, is used, uh, it's not useless. It would be useless if it didn't provide the information of the consequence of disease, and then you learn from that consequence how normal organism works. And your you research learn nothing of, about the, the, you, yeah. the cu curing disease. This is, uh, uh, this is amazing. So the, the complexity of disease and aging, you should stop me when, when the time comes. <laughs> uh, the time complexity of aging and disease uh, is the diagnostic of the complexity of the healthy organism. Nothing more. And I think Nothing that's more. where we're going to have to stop. Yes, it's this. like rusting of iron. Rusting of a bicycle is the same rust as rusting of an aeroplane. But the consequences are much simpler on the bicycle. And you, you think that, that it, the, the, I'm, I'm making the point, the same chemistry of, of rusting, of oxidation, uh, will appear uh, with simple effects on the bicycle and very complicated eff effects on, 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 on aeroplane. And we think that our diseases are incredibly complicated and, 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 and no wonder that we don't have any results because it's so complicated. No, it is not complicated. It is simple. What, what is complicated is the complexity of, of our organism. So if we go to the origin, to the root cause yeah. and act on it, then a miracle could happen, yeah. I'm stopping now. A uh, <laughs> miracle could happen that it would be simpler and more effective at the origin of these free radicals yeah. and protein damage if we can act on it, and we can act on it, uh, and do <laughs> yeah. act on it, uh, that it will be simpler to eliminate all of age-related diseases, cancers, uh, Alzheimer's, and all together, then pick a single one. Then a single one. It, this, is, this is the message, the main, now I can shut up, that <laughs> I wanted to share with you because it's, a, because it's important, yeah. because it's an option. It's an option. Shall we eliminate all of diseases that kill us in a simple way, or shall we exhaust ourselves to fix uh, uh, things with disease by disease as, as, as we do. So we right? end, Professor Edmund, then on, so that, on a hopeful note. This, that this, this can be something that can not only slow down This aging, is a possibility that I, I would bet on that is not excluded, and this is, in, this is sufficient that it is not excluded, because it, you, you may think it is impossible to do this, but it is not. There are four persons per 10,000 
called centenarians. Yeah. Centenarians don't get any of these diseases and therefore don't die of them at age of 70 or 80, but die by switching off at 100, okay? Yeah. So this is the project, this is what we have learned, the summary of what we had learned from basic science, and now Emmanuel wants to, to, <laughs> to, to tell why didn't you why didn't you talk about skin? <laughs> but there will be others. There will be other colleagues of Thank mine you very much, talking Professor about Edmund. about specifically aging of skin, right? Uh, uh, so perfect. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Professor Radman. We have to yes. stop there. Distilling a 50-year career into 20 minutes. I hope Not that easy. this last message passed because yes. then I can go home and sleep. Thank right. you. Right. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you, Miroslav, and thank you, Claire, for this fascinating interview with such a body language, so thank you. So we've already received some questions, so please keep them coming for our Q&A session at the end, please. Okay, so now, beyond the genome, we have the proteome. So these few words sum up our tonight's discussion so well. Aging, aging well, age-related diseases. I suggest to continue this deep dive into aging with Professor Louise Serpel. She is a professor of biochemistry and a director of Sussex Neuroscience. Her specialty is understanding the misfolding of proteins associated with Alzheimer's and how they are involved in the progression of the disease. Until recently, Professor Serpel didn't know us at NAOS. She accepted our invitation and we thank her warmly for that. So without further ado, I let Professor Serpel enlighten you. Hello, everybody. I'd like to just start by um, thanking Professor Radman for uh, just such an amazing talk. It was really, really inspiring for me as a scientist. Um, and also to thank the team at NAS um, and Emmanuel um, for inviting me to talk to you today. So what I'm going to talk about today is um, this sort of picture that I see of um, what's happening during aging. So what you see here is as we age, as Professor Radman has discussed, um, we undergo all sorts of issues. Uh, we have our own genetics, of course, and we also have um, bacteria that inhabit our gut and, and the rest of us that, are, that affect us. But we also have to consider um, our exposure to the environment over time. Um, and we also may get infections um, and undergo stress. And these things all affect our proteome. So they all affect the proteins that we've been talking about um, earlier today. And over time, damage starts to accumulate. So there are nine correlates of aging. And what I wanted to point out, really, is this main one here, this one in purple, which is the loss of the proteome. So as we age, there is a, a decline in proteostasis, which is essentially how we maintain our proteome. Um, and as we age, that starts to decline. So we're going to focus on that today. Um, and when we talk about proteins, we need to rethink some of the things that you might have learned in school. Um, this is the central dogma, which you may remember from school, where we go from DNA to RNA to protein. But we need to add to this because we need to consider that this protein, which is made of amino acids, oops, uh, will change because it needs to fold into a three-dimensional structure. And that is absolutely essential for each protein's function. And this next slide shows you just some of the proteins that we know make up the proteome. And what I think you can appreciate, although you don't need to be able to read this, is that they're all different shapes and sizes. And each one of these has a very specific function that's associated with its shape. And so each protein needs to fold correctly. 
And so this is what I mean by protein folding. So this is a polypeptide chain or a protein. Each one of those letters is an amino acid. And so you can think of it as beads on a string. And this is what it looks like when it first gets synthesized. And it needs to fold up every single time into exactly the correct functional structure. So every time a protein folds, it needs to always fold in the same way and end up looking exactly the same shape and size in order to perform its function. And so that's what's shown here. This protein is now fully folded, and every time it folds, it will always fold the same. Or will it? So sometimes proteins misfold, and I think Professor Radman did mention that. So misfolding is when the proteins don't fold correctly. This means we lose potentially their function, but we also have another problem, which is a gain of function. And what I've done here is to show you this uh, as a movie. So essentially what this is, is some proteins in a box. And it's in silico, so it's in a computer. And so what you notice is that these proteins have been given a bit of energy, so they're just moving about. And I think what you might notice is as they start to move about over time, they start to associate with one another. And they don't associate in just a very random sort of way. They actually do in this in a very organized, ordered way. And you might be able to see here at the top that these proteins have organized themselves, they almost look stripy. So they've organized themselves in a very specific, organized way, or we think of as ordered. And this is really important. These proteins misfold, and they aggregate or they self-assemble. That's the way that we discuss them. And so it's really important that we maintain the proteome. So we've obviously evolved in order to maintain the protein. Uh, each of our proteins, um, and this shows a whole scheme of what's going on in the lifetime of a protein. And although I don't have a pointer, I'll have to just sort of wave uh, randomly. And these, these little wiggly lines, the red ones, go on to form this correctly folded native structure that you see on the right-hand side. They can then sometimes during their lifetime be degraded then that forms the amino acids that then are recycled to make new proteins. So that's a really important point. But occasionally, they will misfold and start to assemble to form these lower structures that are called amyloid, which I'll talk to you a bit more about. And if we have oxidative stress, which accompanies aging, then this can speed up the likelihood of that happening. And what I want to point out in this slide is these green sort of circular structures, which are chaperones. So what the chaperone system, and this generally I'm talking about protein chaperones here, they've evolved in order to protect our proteins from misfolding um, and protect them at all the vulnerable stages during their lifespan. So if we disrupt proteostasis, then potentially we end up with um, a set of diseases which are called uh, pro, um, amyloidoses. And it, these are this is a collective name for, for pro protein misfolding in disease. So it can be all sorts of proteins. I can tell you a bit more about that in a moment. Some of these are neurodegenerative diseases, like Alzheimer's disease. And some of them are systemic or peripheral amyloidosis, where you might get amyloid collecting in different organs, like the heart, the skin, or um, in the kidneys, for example. Um, and what we notice when we look at um, these graphical representations of Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and amyotrophic lateral sclerosis is we see that as we age, the likelihood of us getting these diseases increases, and it does exactly what Professor Radman said it would do, to, uh, to curve um, and increase as we age. The likelihood increases as we age. And so what exactly is this amyloid? So we can define it as protein aggregation or assembly or accumulation in the tissues. Um, and we can follow its trajectory. So we can follow it from beginning at the left-hand side where we have an individual protein chain which starts to self-assemble and starts to form these long fibers. And these fibers all collect together. And on the right-hand side, you can see an amyloid plaque which is found in Alzheimer's disease, for example. 
Um, this is an example of an amyloidosis where amyloid fibrils collect in the heart muscle. So on the left-hand side, you can see a normal heart muscle. And on the right-hand side, you can see a heart muscle where somebody is suffering from a light-chain amyloidosis. So that's accumulation of antibodies in the tissue. And you can see that that would stiffen the heart and cause disease. And this is what these amyloid fibrils look like when you look at them at very high magnification under an electron microscope. And so that you can see that they're long, long chains um, of protein. And um, just to very quickly say that there are lots of different diseases that are associated with different proteins, all of which form amyloid, and all of them are associated with aging. Some of them are genetic as well, but even those will increase in likelihood as we age. So I want to give you an example of Alzheimer's disease, and the reason for that really is because that's what I work on, and that's particularly my area of interest. And so what you see here is on the left-hand side is a healthy brain, and on the right-hand side, an advanced Alzheimer's disease brain. And you can already see that there's neurodegeneration that's gone on on the right-hand side. And so if we look into this brain tissue, we see these aggregates of proteins, and these are amyloid plaques that you can see under a light micrograph. And then if we look in a bit more detail, now you can see these amyloid fibrils. So there's these long chains of protein that have self-assembled and accumulated in the tissues. And then if we look in more detail even, we can see the proteins stacked up to form this structure. And if you remember when I was showing you that movie, this is a very organized arrangement. This is not just a random collection of proteins. This is very organized. And it's held together all the way along the fiber by hydrogen bonds, making this incredibly strong. So essentially, these misfolded proteins accumulate in the tissue, and we can't remove them. They're really rock hard. And the other thing to notice about this is this is a very repetitive structure, which means that lots of different proteins can access this structure. And often I talk about this a little bit like the rungs of a ladder. So each one of the rungs is a protein. So the important thing to consider is that these amyloid fibrils are not good for us. When they collect in the tissue, they're clearly not good for us. But also the process of assembly seems to cause disease. And we know that they affect different parts of the cell. And this, in this example, I've used a neuron or a brain cell because I've been talking about Alzheimer's disease. But this would be true of any cell, for a kidney cell or a heart cell or a skin cell. And these cells have lots of different organelles within them. The mitochondria that produces power, the lysosomes, which degrade proteins, so essentially they're the dustbins of the cell. In a neuron, we have to transport cargo from one end of a cell to another. And again, in neurons or brain cells, we need the connections that give uh, the message to the next um, brain cell. And all of these are surrounded by this plasma membrane. And I think Professor Radman referred to this as the skin of the cell. So we know that all, each one of these things damages. So essentially what we think is happening in aging is this is a cascade event. So what happens is that initially the genetics, our genetic background and our exposure to different environmental factors will depend on how likely we are to succumb to uh, one of these misfolding diseases. In Alzheimer's disease, this leads to a triggering of the aggregation of amyloid beta, so this is one of the proteins involved in Alzheimer's disease, which then we believe leads to the aggregation of another protein called tau, uh, which is the next one down, and that spreads throughout the brain. So that leads to this, this distribution and neurodegeneration that happens in Alzheimer's disease. And as you see on the left-hand side, aging increases this likelihood, and of course, lifestyle and environment will play a role. So what do we do about this? This is a, a, an image I showed you earlier on where we see the process of aggregation. And if we want to try and stop it, we need to try and stop it at some point during this pathway. Perhaps we choose one of the arrows to try and stop it at that point and prevent it from going any further. And so you may have heard in the news there's an antibody which specifically um, 
binds to a particular um, species in this pathway. It's called lecanemab, um, and it's an antibody that binds around that sort of point in the pathway. But actually, on this slide, I've also shown that green structure, which I referred to earlier as a chaperone. And if we really want to stop these diseases, what we really need to do is to prevent these, this misfolding pathway from happening in the first place. And the best way to do that would be to use the chaperone system. So let's go back to that slide I started with at the beginning. Now, in this, this time, I've added in the chaperones because what we need to really consider is could we change the trajectory of this um, proteome decline over time if we were to able to harness the power of the chaperones? And what we know is that with aging, the efficiency of our chaperones declines. Many of them are proteins, so they decline too. And so what we need to do is to really try and harness the power of these proteins um, and other chaperones. So just to finally summarise, um, what I've talked to you about today is the proteo proteome um, and how ageing leads to damage of the proteome. Um, this leads to protein misfolding and then protein aggregation, so the self-assembly of these things to form these amyloid structures. And this leads to tissue degeneration and disease. So we need to try and tackle this by stopping it um, in its tracks. So I want to just finish by acknowledging um, my team. So uh, shown in all of the pictures here are all the people that actually work with me and do the experiments in the lab. So um, through the lab, lots of students go through and lots of staff, and um, it's a really lively, exciting environment. Um, along the bottom and at the top, I've included um, some of the funding that we um, have from charities and um, also from... Um, from grant agencies um, run by the UK government. Um, these are all the people. Um, and I just wanted to finish by um, thanking you all for listening so quietly. And also to um, mention, this is Brighton. This is where I work and live. Um, and occasionally, it's really beautiful. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Serpel. OK. Uh, yeah. Thank you for these important insights on health. So what if we talked about the skin now? But I must warn you, it won't be about miracle solution or, or Benjamin Button secrets, just facts and conviction based on science, on scientific demonstration. So for this, I am pleased to introduce a member of our scientific committee, Isabelle Benoit. Isabelle, the floor is yours. Good evening, everybody. I'm very happy to be here with you tonight. I would like to conclude this session with a focus on NAOS Aging Science contribution to the momentous step forward that we are witnessing today with this new scientific era. A focus on uh, the uh, R&D process that allowed us to go from the scientific theory to a solution, a tangible application for age management strategies. So if we rewind a little bit, the basis of our work was this new scientific paradigm by Professor Radman that um, proteome protection is the key to cellular longevity. Indeed, proteins providing all the functions of life in a cell or in a tissue, it's only logical that life extension in good health, which is our definition of longevity, it's logical that this increased longevity implies protecting the proteome. It's logical, but it's also, I would say, um, experimented in nature, and it has even been validated by evolution itself. Indeed, Professor Radman, uh, this new theory that you posit today is uh, the result of a study that you conducted on examples of evolutionary perfection. While trying to unlock the secrets of longevity, you um, studied longevity heroes. These extremophile organisms uh, 
able to survive in environmental conditions that should kill any form of life. Extremophile organisms can sustain high level of radiations, extreme temperature changes, high level of oxidative stress, desiccation. And they are called examples of evolutionary perfection because in a way, they manage to transform a hostile environment into an optimal one. More particularly, as Professor Hanman said, he studied Deinococcus radiodurance, this small bacteria from the can of meat. Radiodurance, for those of you who took Latin, means able to sustain high level of radiation. And as Professor Hanman said, these tiny bacteria can survive doses of radiation that would kill a human body. So as a stubborn geneticist, uh, Professor Hanman, when he began studying these bacteria, he was expecting to find uh, solutions, explanation for the extreme robustness at the level of the DNA. But he was surprised to discover that it's not at the level of the DNA. The DNA gets fragmented, but it doesn't kill the bacteria because the DNA repairing proteins are efficient performing. So the key to longevity is not robustness of the genome, it is robustness of the proteome. And because resistance to radiation and resistance to time go hand in hand, this is also true for human beings. This is when the partnership with NAOS comes on stage. So this picture dates back from the early days of a urine counter with the NAOS CEO and founder, Jean-Noël Torel. Picture was taken maybe 15 years ago. Well, first let me say, Miro, that just for the sake of scientific demonstration, you, you didn't age. So you are the living proof of the relevance of your theory. Huh? Uh, but back to our uh, topic. Uh, I'm talking about an encounter, but it's rather a matter of uh, friendship, loyalty and shared vision, a positive vision about life, a vision about how science should contribute to the society, and the will to be the change they want for the world. So with the help of NAOS, uh, Professor Hadman could uh, elaborate further on his theory in the MEDIS, Mediterranean Institute of Life Science, and he granted the um, exclusive application of his work to NAOS. So ap application of Professor Hadman for human care and skin care is for NAOS, and this is what we will uh, describe today, what we discuss today. So this is a um, great uh, privilege for us, this exclusive right of application. It's also a responsibility, because if we are convinced, I should say as we are convinced, that protein protection could be a breakthrough in age management strategies, it's our responsibility to transform the theory into a solution. And this is a scientific journey I would like to guide you through tonight, how we went from theory to application for age management strategies. Let's begin with a little bit of uh, vocabulary, because we talk about proteome, but maybe not everybody knows what proteome is. So we can say that proteome is to the proteins what the genome is to the genes. It means that the proteome comprises, sorry, I'm lost in my, uh, the proteome comprises all the proteins in a body, in a cell. Proteome comes from the ancient Greek protos, which means first and essential. First, because in terms of quantity, after water, proteins are the second most abundant element in a cell, in a tissue. If you take the skin, for instance, in terms of water content, depending on age, you have between 60% of 70% of water. Protein content in the skin, between 15 and 28. So if we take the extreme, 70% of water, 28% of protein, it doesn't leave much room for the rest. Okay? First. Essential. Indeed, proteins are essential to any form of life. They can be structural protein or they can be functional proteins. Structural proteins in your skin, you know this. Collagen, elastin, keratin. 
large molecules that constitute the scaffold of the skin. But you also have other proteins, usually smaller, involved in all the machinery of the skin, uh, in, involved in all cellular functions. You have growth factors, hormones, cytokines, interleukins, enzymes. All of these are proteins, and they provide all the functions of life in the cells and in the tissues. If our skin is a living world, it is thanks to the proteome. It is via the proteome. So logically, any impairment of proteome functioning impairs the life of the skin, and damage to the proteome is the root cause of skin aging. This discovery that proteome damage is the root cause of skin aging uh, induced us at Naus Aging Science to completely redirect our R&D strategy. We aimed all our efforts at protecting the proteome. This is a significant change because the dogma so far was rather DNA-centric, genomic-centric. But we do believe that it is more important to protect the proteome rather than protecting uh, the genome. Why? First, because we learn from nature. And what nature teaches us is that when the proteome is damaged, sorry, when the genome is damaged, it is the proteome that repairs it. So it's better to cure the doctor rather than cure one isolated patient. This is the first reason. The second reason is based, I would say, on common sense. The genome, as we all know, is a full set of genes. The genome represents everything that could happen. But not all genes are expressed. Actually, many of them remain silent. It's only when a gene is translated into a protein that the gene becomes reality. So to summarize, we could say that the genome is a virtuality and the proteome is a reality. So it's always better in terms of efficiency to focus on the reality rather than on the virtuality. Proteome rather than genome. Okay? So what should we protect the proteome from? The main damage to the proteome is called carbonylation. Carbonylation is a specific kind of oxidation, so it is mediated by free radicals. It is specific to proteins, and it's particularly damaging to the proteins because it blocks the protein under a form under which it is no longer functional, impossible to repair, and very difficult to eliminate. If we remember the intervention from Professor Serpel, a protein, in order to be performing, must be folded in a specific 3D conformation. In this conformation, the sensitive parts of the protein are hidden inside the core of the protein. They are protected. When the protein unfolds, in case of stress, in case of um, problem of replication, it unfolds and it exposes the sensitive parts, which are called hydrophobic amino acids. So these hydrophobic amino acids that used to be protected within the core become exposed, and they are the target of attack by free radicals. And this is the carbonylation. Problem is that unfolded protein, once it is carbonylated, cannot be refolded because the carbonyl group is like a lock. Okay? So the carbonylated protein cannot be repaired. It begins to aggregate, and you have um, aggregates of protein in all age-related disease, as Professor Sarpel told us. The carbonylated protein aggregates are markers of age and accelerators of age. Markers because you can correlate the age of the cell, the age of the tissue, with the number of a protein aggregates. Okay? These protein aggregates are the hallmark of all age-related diseases. An accelerator, because these aggregates are too large to be digested, elim eliminated by the cell natural detoxifying system, so they accelerate aging. 
The consequence on the skin of carbonylation can be seen on all the layers of the skin. At the level of the stratum corneum, the outer layer of the skin, carbonylation induces loss of hydration. At the level of the epidermis, carbonylation induces loss of radiance, loss of evenness. And in the dermis, increased wrinkles, less firmness and less elasticity. So what we must keep as a take-home message from this slide is that preventing protein carbonylation ahead allows you to have, with one single approach, comprehensive approach, to have an effect on all age signs of the skin. You only prevent skin protein carbonylation, and you have an effect on the five signs of aging. How could we protect the proteome? If we remember, we have the protein, which is the target, and we have the attackers, the free radicals. The most efficient approach would be to protect the protein and to neutralize the free radicals. To protect the protein, we have natural effectors of protein protection in any uh, organism, called chaperone, as Professor Serpel, Serpel said. Sorry. Chaperones, which are produced in normal state with a role to properly fold the protein, are overexpressed in case of stress with a role to either refold the protein or to cover the sensitive amino acids, the parts which are sensitive to carbonylation. It's like a physical shield, a way to reduce the sensitivity of proteins to carbonylation. And we also have, in the wild, in nature, in our body, Molecules that naturally scavenge the free radicals, they are called uh, antioxidants. So the best solution to have a complete protection of the proteome would be to be chaperone-like and antioxidant. This is where now's aging science comes on stage because we found this naturally occurring chaperone-like and antioxidant molecule. Where in another extremophile organism, so not Deinococcus radiodurans, but the little sister, I would say, called snow bacteria. The Latin name is Arthrobacter agilis, but I prefer snow bacteria because uh, it also shows where it was found. Uh, it was found in a snowflake. It was first isolated from a snowflake. So this is a truly a true story, it's a genuine story. It was snowing one evening in Paris, and a um, researcher from the team of Professor Hadman took a snowflake and tried to check whether maybe some bacteria would have survived, and he found the snow bacteria. This snow bacteria is able to sustain high level of radiation up in the sky, extreme cold, extreme dehydration. It's an extremophile organism. How can these tiny bacteria survive so aggressive environmental conditions? Because it has learned to synthesize its own proteome protectors. Small molecules called bacteriorubirins that snow bacteria has managed to synthesize. These um, bacteriorubirins are at the same time chaperone-like and antioxidant. And Specifically, in snow bacteria, bacteriorubirins are available under six different forms. It's a unique fact in nature. You can find bacteriorubirin in other bacteria, but only in snow bacteria in six, under six different forms. And these six forms sign a special affinity for a wide array of proteins. With six different bacteriorubirins, you can protect a wide variety of proteins. It's a little bit as if this tiny bacteria has benefited from 3.8 billion years of evolution to be able to synthesize the ultimate protector of the proteome. And this is what we extract at NOW's Aging Science. We extract these six different forms of bacteriorubirin, and this is a way for us to complete the circle. We have uh, inspiration from evolution with this new paradigm of proteome protection. 
We have the exquisite design by nature to find these molecules that are at the same time chaperone-like and antioxidant in order to optimize skin natural resources, to optimize the proteome, to protect the proteome of uh, the skin. With proteome protection, the skin is empowered to be the actor of its own health and beauty, longer and better. It can fulfill the mission it has been assigned by centuries of evolution to be the protector of our organism, to be our best ally to withstand the passing of time. So I repeat, with proteome protection, skin is empowered to be longer and better the actor of its own health and beauty. This is the very definition of ecobiology. Our skin is a living world and ecobiology protects it. Thank you, Isabel. Thanks a lot. You stay with me? I stay with you. Okay, so just before the Q&A session, we have a special message from our founder, Jean-Noël Torel. Jean-Noël is a man with vision. Let's take a look. Bonjour à tous, je suis très heureux d'être parmi vous, un peu malheureux d'être par euh, voix interposée et vidéo, mais euh, je tenais absolument à vous dire quelques mots. Je suis plutôt fier, de, au fond, d'apporter, de mettre sur la table, avec Miro, avec Isabelle, cette molécule et cette euh, avancée scientifique par rapport à la découverte de Miro sur la, la protéine par rapport à l'ADN dans les processus de vieillissement. Aujourd'hui, on se limite à la peau et on peut aller beaucoup plus loin. On est déjà dans les applications dermatologiques. Et il y a un premier pas qui fera suite à cette conférence quand on présentera le produit, qui a donné des preuves un peu exceptionnelles. C'est normal par rapport à une molécule exceptionnelle qui peut prétendre peut-être demain à, à traiter des, des dégénérescences au niveau des organismes vivants. Alors, est-ce qu'on rêvera d'être un jour au niveau de Parkinson, Alzheimer J'en sais rien. Mais si on ne rêve pas grand, on ne risque pas de découvrir des grandes choses. Je suis fier du travail de mes équipes. Merci beaucoup de votre écoute. And remember, we need to dream big to go far. So, um, I will ask Professor Hanman and Professor Serpel to join us on stage and I will propose you three to have a seat and answer the few questions we receive and thank you for that. Okay, just a few minutes. Uh, first question for you, Miroslav. Okay. Are you ready? <laughs> so, just explain us, do chaperon molecules exist in all living beings, everywhere? Is it clear for you, my question? Uh, do chaperon uh, molecules exist in all living beings? Uh, I don't know. Really? No, uh -uh. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't... The, the protein chaperons have very well studied um, since, for instance, since a long time. But the, the property of the chemical or small molecules, uh, chemical uh, uh, chaperons, is, is, not, is not that advanced, really. So I couldn't, I couldn't say for, for, for sure. Uh, what we have to do is to see how, uh, how these bacterial rubrins, which which, which change the uh, charge and polarity by, uh, by varying the sugar uh, um, entities at, at the end, how eff effectively they would penetrate, they become uh, you know, uh, uh, both hydrophobic in the middle and hydrophilic at the end, uh, and how effectively they, they go into the cell. Now, we have to deal now with the phase that is uh, where you can't be too, too smart. You, you, you have to 
test uh, and, and find what is pharmacokinetic of, uh, of these small molecules. It's good news that they are small because if they are big, you know, you can't transport a, a whole protein uh, uh, into individual cells, so fortunately they are, they are small. But when, when they are small, you know, then you have ki kidneys, liver, and all. So this is, for me, the, the boring, the more pa painful uh, part of, of the work is getting, getting to real application, to, 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 to a product that one would want to take and, 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 and oneself. Okay, and it's, it's only if they are lucky, it, it, it could take just a few years, but otherwise it could take a long time. Right. Okay, That's a, thank you. Yeah. Okay, yeah. second question for you, Dr. Serpel. Uh, you are talking about neurodegeneration due to amyloid, uh, amyloid beta, sorry, I'm not a scientist, so ami amyloid beta and two aggregation and spreading. What are the other age-related diseases concerned by protein misfolding and aggregation. I think you, you, you talk about that, but just remind us yeah. the other age-related disease concerned by protein misfolding and aggregation. So there are many diseases that are, are associated with aging, and, and the ones that come to mind are things like Parkinson's disease that people will have heard of, um, motor neuron disease, and even some of the genetic forms of amyloidosis they, they don't happen in people until they're in their 50s. So even with a genetic predisposition for a disease, it doesn't actually manifest until much later. And so that suggests that aging is having a really serious contributory factor. Diabetes type 2 is a good example of a <coughs> protein aggregation, protein misfolding disease that tends to affect people later in their lives. Okay, thank, thank you. you. It's not only neurodegener neurodegenerative disease, it's also diabetes. So we really have a good correlation between protein aggregates and all uh, age-related diseases. So it's okay, and you, Isabel, just one question. Let's uh, check my notes. How do you position the proteome approach versus the other theory of aging? Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, telomere shorting, for instance. It's a very good question because tonight we don't want you to believe that this is just a new theory of aging. We have heard very new theories of aging in the past and this is not today a new one that will be uh, out of fashion in, um, in, few, uh, in few decades. Uh, we believe indeed that proteome protection is the mother of all theories of aging. We talk about meta-theory of aging because proteome protection overlaps with most theories of aging. If you, you are talking about uh, telomere attrition, which is one of the most famous um, theories of aging, so you remember telomeres, which are at the end of the DNA, uh, with the role to protect the DNA, with successive replication of the cell, the telomere shortens. And you can correlate, so it's an inverse correlation, the shorter the telomere, the, um, the, the older is the cell. So to prevent telomere attrition, to prevent aging, sorry, you want to prevent telomere attrition. There is an enzyme in the body who is responsible for that, called telomerase. So you want to boost telomerase to prevent telomere attrition. But telomerase is a protein, and it is one of the most sensitive to carbonylation proteins. So we see here the overlap between um, protein protection and theories of aging. And you can do the same with other theories of aging. Therefore, we, this notion of meta-theory of aging. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have one last question. So, if we don't, if we don't answer to all your questions, we sorry, we'll try to uh, propose you written question, written answer. Okay. <laughs> Feeling lonely? <laughs> How is it that a product can penetrate up to the proteome and take care of it? So that's a question for me, I suppose? Yes, I think so. Uh, it's something that we have demonstrated. First, we put the um, bacterial ruberins in a specific galenic that allows to go through the various skin layers. So first you have to remember that you have proteins at all skin layers. 
Okay? So while the active ingredient penetrates, it protects all the proteins at all the uh, various skin uh, levels, at, in all the layers. And we have demonstrated using front cell, uh, which is um, a specific uh, test to measure the penetration. We have demonstrated that we have good penetration of our active ingredient. This is a work which is conducted in Laos Aging Science. Therefore, we can uh, hope to have an effect on all aging signs. Thank you, thank you to all of you. Uh, ah, just one last word from... That from the two well-known, this family of bacterial rubarins that Isabel mentioned, and then a manganese complex uh, from Dinococcus radiodurans. So both small but relatively complex molecules that protect proteins against oxidative damage have been shown in either worms or in, in flies, in drosophila, in fruit fly, to extend, the, just given in, as a drinking water, uh, just give it, a, you know, in, in the drinking water, to extend the lifespan for about 40%, which is, which is marvelous. That means that in, in spite of these fears, will it penetrate, will it be cleared by, you know, uh, digestive and enzymes and livers and, and kidneys and so on? Well, leave that, there is an effect. On, on these animals, so it says that the, it makes sense to, to, to be optimist and try eventually, eventually in people. On the skin is the easiest, of course. Yeah. I, yeah. But I'll be the one first to drink. I, I, mm. I, okay, I, and I like we have that type yeah. of beverage okay. during the cocktail, so. <laughs> yes. Thank all you. Right. Okay, thank you to all of you. Uh, thank you for taking part in this now Aging Science Conference. Professor Hanman, Professor Serpel, and Isabel Benoit, we really appreciate all your insights this evening. Thanks for sharing your knowledge with passion, with conviction. Thank you very much. Thank you.